Uh, w welcome to all. Um, it's, I'm Reinhold Martin. It's my pleasure on behalf of my colleagues here at Columbia's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, and our good friend Keller Easterling. Um, uh, it's my distinct honor to introduce this evening's Dudleff Merton's lecturer, Professor Dwight Carey. But before I do that, uh, just a few words uh, I, to mark the occasion. I, I was saying before, I, I can't quite believe it, but it's been over a dozen years since the inaugural lecture in this series, um, which is devoted, uh, I think you know, to the histories of modernity and was established in, in 2011 with Keller's uh, generosity to commemorate the untimely passing, but also, I think, the untimely, and maybe I, I would say at least, unapologetically modern life of our dear friend, the architectural historian Detlef Mertens. His was a life lived unbound by the darkness of modern times, a kind of dialectical darkness reflected in glass uh, that Detlef, at least, and I, I, I'm sure for many others too, but it just seemed like we were always discussing this um, endlessly, but alas, uh, and, and sadly, all too briefly. Uh, in our shared admiration for the complex thinkers, for example, of the Frankfurt School, and especially for Detlef, the German Jewish philosopher and cultural critic, Walter Benjamin. Characteristically, Detlef addressed many of his published writings, again, I think most here know, um, to the affirmative, generative side of Benjamin's thought. But like all of us, uh, he knew well the tragedy by which that thought was marked. Uh, not only the historical tragedy in flight from which uh, Benjamin took his own life in 1940, but the tragedy of history itself. So most of you know the image, the sort of famous image. A picture, actually it's a monoprint, by Paul Clay depicts a figure to which Clay gave the name Angelus Novus, the new angel, <clears throat> staring out at us, eyes wide, mouth open, wings spread. For Benjamin, where we see a chain of events, this angel sees a single mounting catastrophe, piling wreckage at its feet. The angel would like to stay and repair the damage, but, you know, a wind is blowing the figure, I and mean, of course, is this an allegory, uh, is this allegory of history, also somehow the historian? A wind is blowing this figure backwards into the future. In Laurie Anderson's rendition, this storm, this storm is called progress. Now, of course, we need only put a date, also 1940, to Menuhin's famous angel of history to know the specific historical catastrophe, the full scope of which he himself did not live to see. But all, all too sadly, again, what has made this image of this angel ring so true, so unbearably timely, for us, even today, is the chain of tragedy upon tragedy that continues to build this pile of death and debris skyward. This is exactly what not what, you know, th this is my point in a way. Detlef was so extraordinarily generous and affirmative in his, in his spirit that, that this is kind of basically what we talk about, you know. Um, this pile of debris building sky skywards as it has done for centuries. And yet, again, recalling the spirit, Detlef's spirit, in fact, for me, his slightly mischievous, optimistic laugh. Um, it remains our task uh, to imagine that along the way, at least some of the damage might be repaired, um, if only in the fullness of time, uh, but necessarily, nonetheless. So, well, okay, so to my mind, uh, and you know, perhaps stretching this chain of seem seemingly unrelated events to its breaking point, I do think that it's a sim similar sense of historical, and, and we can also add today ecological, uh, reconstruction and repair of living, working, and growing in and among the ruins that brings Dwight Carey uh, to us this evening, as I think you'll see. Uh, Dwight A. Carey is Assistant Professor of Art and the History of Art at Amherst College, where he works and teaches at the limits of architectural studies. Dwight's fundamentally interdisciplinary research involves the examination of the built environments of slavery, that epic tragedy, um, uh, from uh, the, a methodological perspective that combines archival uh, and on-site analysis, laboratory investigations of building materials, um, and oral history. 
all of this comes together in a fascinating book project that I heard a piece of discussed in this room about a year ago um, on the Indian Ocean world uh, titled Masters of the Land, Architecture, Slavery, and Labor in Mauritius, uh, to which I, I believe his talk this evening adds, or from, I guess it's which it's excerpted. Currently, in fact, White is working literally in and among the ruins in Mauritius, um, gathering the fragments, I guess, um, in that Benjamin way, uh, in collaboration with his Amherst colleague, um, geologist Peter Crowley, to determine the chemical composition uh, of samples of mortar, plaster, coral, stone, and wooden flooring taken from 18th century Mauritian buildings. Comparing the results with archival information on the skills that enslaved people possessed in masonry, woodworking, and coral smithing, uh, he aims to develop a natural resource history of Mauritian architecture. This is the affirmative. Right? Um, a history of the island that accounts for the ways in which architectural knowledge and labor rendered slaves, as, as he puts it, quote, I love this phrase, the mavens of the land, uh, the masters of a vast island that only they understood. Since Mauritius does not have a native population, that mean, the, the means through which, and maybe you'll you know, introduce this, but I'm just, just for framing, um, uh, the means by uh, the, the, um, the mean, the, since they don't have a um, native population, uh, the means through which slaves from Madagascar, West Africa, India, and East Africa became masters of the land, slaves become masters, uh, suggests uh, that they indigenized themselves, a fascinating concept, uh, or made themselves the de facto of native population through cultivating a form of local knowledge that positioned them as the only group in world history, in fact, history, history's angel, uh, to have ever made use of the resources that, that this once, uh, of this once unclaimed land. So, Carey's work thereby interrogates the meaning of indigeneity, the limits of colonialism, and the role that architecture can play in opening up discussion on these issues. Tonight, that discussion of recognition, and in this case, even of role reversal from, in other words, slave to master, if not, you know, we don't know, exactly repair, begins with the 14th annual Detlef Merton's lecture presented to us now by Dwight Carey under the title Architecture, Landscape, and, the labor, and Labor on a Strategic Atoll. Diego Garcia in the Past and Present. Dwight. So um, thank you, Reinhold, for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming. It really is great to be here. So um, today I'm going to present something that is an excerpt from that book project. It's a little bit different, um, but you'll see it's about Diego Garcia. Um, and so here is the talk, Architecture, Landscape, and Labor on a Strategic Atoll, Diego Garcia in the Past and Present. So I will begin. From the perspective of architectural studies, the Indian Ocean island of Diego Garcia may seem unreachable. That would not be an unfounded assumption. It is nearly impossible to study Diego Garcia through the methods of fieldwork or visual analysis, located about 1,350 miles northeast of the post-colonial island nation of Mauritius. Diego Garcia is a 12-square-mile coral atoll that lies about 1,100 miles southwest of India. As the largest landmass in the Chigos Archipelago, Diego Garcia is one of a smattering of 60 small atolls. Today, the island houses a notorious US Naval and Air Force base that purportedly boasts one of the many secret prisons where military personnel torture suspected jihadists. Only approved members of the American or British military can visit Diego Garcia, and even the island's former inhabitants can no longer set foot on this now notorious island. When erecting a military base from 1968 to 1973, the United States conspired with British colonizers to evict all 2,000 inhabitants from the entire archipelago of the Chagos Islands. The reasoning was that although Diego Garcia held strategic importance for Anglo-American special forces, the remote atoll was otherwise insignificant. According to the military's logic, 
the local inhabitants who all descend from 18th century enslaved laborers had done little to illustrate why their island mattered in the grand scope of world history. With these ideas solidified, the British and the American governments then deported all Chagosians to Mauritius and Seychelles, two countries where many of their 21st century descendants now live in poverty. In fact, one of the conditions for ind of independence for the Republic of Mauritius was that the former British colony would be required to give citizenship to all of the evicted residents of the Chagos Islands. What remains of the traditional landscapes that these inhabitants left behind is largely unknown since even they cannot return to their old homes. Too often, architectural historians have shied away from such places, communities, and histories. Since we cannot go to Diego Garcia, and since the traditional architecture of the island has been all but destroyed, the implication would be that the atoll is out of bounds for architectural studies. Even a Google Maps view of this secretive island elicits images of military encampments, airport runways, and mess halls, hardly the vernacular structures that could give us an idea of the traditional architecture that once existed. Likewise, an examination of the scholarship on this island indicates that the study of Diego Garcia is largely the province of anthropologists, people who have interviewed the evicted residents in order to understand what their old home means to them as they live in diaspora today. This paper argues for an architectural studies approach to Diego Garcia. Usually, when architectural historians define the world historical value of a site, they do so through an engagement of standing or excavated edifices. We cannot do that on Diego Garcia. Nevertheless, if we read with and against the colonial archive, we can mine histories of enslaved expertise that show how Chagosian people have rendered this remote island a part of world history. This effort matters today as the islands and their former inhabitants face a post-colonial future that may even result in resettlement. To speak to the concerns of heritage and belonging in this emerging post-colonial context, we can embrace an approach that goes beyond the analysis of buildings. After all, the American military has nearly obliterated all of the historic architecture. Recognizing this loss, we can embrace the textual side of the architectural archive rather than its visual manifestations. We have almost no information on what the historic buildings of Diego Garcia looked like in their time. Instead, what we can find is a history of colonial labor made by the enslaved East African and Malagasy workers whose linguistic knowledge and ecological skills rendered settlement possible in the first place. This paper considers this body of information as an architectural history, showcasing a narrative where an individual experiences of expertise and labor come out of a colonial archive. This paper thinks through what it would mean to consider the intellectual and ideational lives of enslaved people as the bases for our engagement of colonial sites. Usually, when enslaved labor surfaces in architectural histories of the colonial past, the work that captives perform to raise imperial edifices comes through in the form of generalized descriptions of the traditional knowledge that we can associate with the places where enslaved people come from. Creolization, or the large-scale blending of diverse typologies, often takes the center stage. Rarely do individual people, their specific knowledge worlds, and their unique experiences surface on the page. That is not the case in neighboring disciplines. Historian Jennifer Mar Morgan has explored how the process of mining the archive for narratives of black intimacy can reveal the individual ideas and desires of enslaved women in the Atlantic world. In Indian Ocean Studies, Alicia Schreiker and Nira Washakonge have recently published work that thinks through the role that a critical reading of the colonial archive can play in challenging stereotypes about enslaved people and their descendants. 
Perhaps, they reason, a reexamination of slavery that focuses on individual knowledge and experience can transform contemporary assumptions about both groups. This paper applies a similar approach to the realm of building construction, a field that I define as encompassing all of the work that enslaved people undertook to create a livable world. Hardly a domain that solely describes buildings in isolation, construction, I argue, is a broader field that includes linguistic knowledge, communication, settlement, and production. Redefining construction in this way could bring a more diverse set of experiences and stories into our discussions of the built past. And as we present these stories in a world of wide-ranging militarism and displacement, we could even consider how such knowledge matters for marginalized communities like the Shigozian populations of Diego Garcia today. The archive of construction expertise could hold the key to explicating a history of traditional knowledge in a context where Western militaries and governments have long denied the legitimacy of Shigozian claims to the land. Perhaps this construction archive could even begin to frame our investigation of other militarized locales. In the Indian Ocean world, the challenges that Shigozian people face grow out of colonization. The United States became interested in Diego Garcia because they saw the island as a strategic launch site for aeronautical incursions into the Middle East and South Asia. The French and later British colonizers of earlier eras had similar dreams of using Diego Garcia as a way station for trade with India and China. Uninhabited for most of human time, Diego Garcia entered into the historical record in a rather innocuous way. Portuguese explorers named the island and mentioned it in their ship logs after visiting briefly in the 16th century. The Chagos Islands, however, remained unclaimed for another 200 years. In the 1780s, the French set their sights on Diego Garcia. They hoped to grow bananas, sweet potatoes, millet, lemons, and coconuts on the atoll. Small ships could easily disembark on the sandy beaches, and tropical produce could fetch a high price on the world market. When describing Diego Garcia in the late 18th century, one figure summarized why colonizers found the island to be so alluring. He is worth quoting at length. Quote, this island in the sun is only made of sand piled on top of coral and rock meant for making lime wash and is covered in wood and a tremendous quantity of coconut palms and forms in its design a unique port that could contain shelter from the winds. Beside the coconut palms, the island is abundant in fish, sea turtles, crawfish, and the sea. You can find good quality water in a swamp on, the, on a point on the western side of the island and also in a well that I made on the same coast. There are no reptiles, no venomous insects, and the only four-legged creatures are the small rats that will soon be eradicated by the cats that I left on the island. <laughs> And this is actually releasing cats as a way to reduce rat populations was done quite widely across Indian Ocean islands at this time. This man sought to enhance this island in the sun, but in fact, he ended up hastening environmental change by modifying the terrain and freeing cats and invasive species. Ecological degradation would continue as the French brought pigs and cattle in the coming years. Land modification would only work colonizers' reason if they, quote, introduced a large number of blacks, as one official noted. In October of 1784, 22 enslaved men, three enslaved women, and four enslaved children from Mauritius landed on Diego Garcia. Working under a white supervisor, these captives raised, quote, a beautiful house, end quote, for the head administrator, officials noted without saying more. Enslaved workers also built several service buildings and sheds for invasive pigs, chickens, and goats before establishing workshops for processing coconut oil. 
Colonizers also stood by as they cleared some of the island's native yet haphazardly growing coconut palms in order to make way for more regularly planted rows. The buildings these laborers constructed were made of a total of 35 planks of wood that enslaved carpenters cut and loaded onto ships that came directly from Mauritius. Measuring out at 12 feet in width, 1.6 inches in thickness, and 24 feet in height, in length, sorry, these planks were already primed to render the earliest structures on Diego Garcia the distant copies of the wooden buildings on Mauritius, a much larger yet still distant land. By 1784, one of the enslaved workers who authorities sent to Diego Garcia had begun to make a name for himself. He was Jolie Coeur, an enslaved man who authorities described as, quote, a black Mozambican who speaks very good French, end quote. Under the gaze of the island's overlords, he rose to become the commander of the bonds people who were responsible for cultivating coconut palms and producing coconut oil. That is all that we know about Jolie Coeur, even though the historical record does not give us any other clues about his life we can still see that he was a complicated person. He was likely a polyglot. His French overseers praised him in a way that they hardly ever commended enslaved people. Rarely did French colonizers describe the, the spoken French of the enslaved as, quote, very good. It is likely that Jolie Coeur learned French in Mauritius when working as an enslaved man. It is even more likely that French was not the only language that he spoke proficiently. Hailing from East Africa, Jolie Coeur may have spoken Portuguese, Swahili, Creole, and several other African languages. Such skills clearly grew out of a life defined by what Roshana Johnson describes as a bound cosmopolitan status, or an identity forged as an enslaved person becomes proficient in the languages and cultures of a diverse world as they move as a captive between regions and continents. Born somewhere in Eastern Africa before transiting through Mozambique and having resided on Mauritius and also Diego Garcia, Jolie Coeur was certainly a captive cosmopolitan. He was also an enslaved man who knew how to survive. By the time he entered into the historical record on Diego Garcia, he had already managed to, he had already learned how to manage the labor of others. Jolie Coeur had become an overseer of architectural and, and agricultural labor in his own right. That made him someone who most likely inflicted violence upon other enslaved people. Bound overseers like him often beat captives when they did not meet the demands placed upon them and they were also responsible for inflicting sexual violence. And while the colonial archive offers no information on who Jolie Coeur likely brutalized when he worked as a commander, we can nonetheless assume that he may have felt an affinity towards some French authorities. He must have spent at least some time around them in order to gain a mastery of the French language, mastery that led a colonizer to praise his linguistic skills. And that is exactly why he was undoubtedly a victim of violence. Having spent his life transiting in bondage across the Indian Ocean world, and having worked with French officials as an enslaved man, he withstood the physical, psychological, and emotional abuse that came with being a black person in the presence of white slave owners. His ability to speak French so well was likely a survival mechanism, something that he picked up so that he could maneuver his way through the violent, racist, and manipulative world of French colonialism. Being able to speak French gave him the ability to express his thoughts, feelings, and ideas to people who had power over him. French language proficiency also helped him understand his overseers, listen to their conversations, and better anticipate their next moves. Through listening, speaking, and comprehending, Jolie Coeur could enact his own ag agenda within a racist system. Maybe such maneuvers were exactly what helped him become a commander on Diego Garcia. Maybe he was able to ever so subversively impress his overlords and give them the idea that he was the perfect person to lead other enslaved people on this remote island, 
standing out as a black man from Mozambique who spoke very good French, Jolicoeur signaled that he was a polygot, a cosmopolitan captive, a man with ties to Mauritius, and a man who was set to be a leader on Diego Garcia. None of these qualities were enough to quell his suffering. As complex as Jolicoeur's life was, it was still a life lived in bondage. He struggled under the weight of slavery, and he withstood the same forms of violence as the enslaved people of many of the enslaved people he oversaw. Suffering and pain were unavoidable for all enslaved people, even those who had some degree of status and lived deep in the most remote corners of the Indian Ocean world. As always, production grew out of violence. Under the threat of punishment, the bonds people who worked under Jolicoeur's authority manufactured 12 barrels worth of coconut oil, which sold for around 8,000 leaves on Mauritius in 1784. Coconut oil was a, food, a source of fuel, a food additive, and a component in soap, and it rendered Diego Garcia profitable for the first time in history. But with only one surgeon and two nurses there to treat captives, the island was yet another place where forced laborers, such as the only pregnant woman among the first group of enslaved inhabitants, suffered from inadequate medical care. Merely listed as pregnant, with no other information supplied on her age, origins, or expertise, the enslaved woman who was about to give birth likely farmed coconuts until the final days of gestation. Given that access to midwives, doctors, or a community of other enslaved women who have given birth under similar circumstances was exceedingly limited on Diego Garcia, it is likely that both she and her child died in labor. Without knowing who this woman was or what she experienced, we can only confirm that she lived in pain within a brutally overworked labor force. Life was excruciating for her, just as it was hard for all of the other enslaved people on this remote island. That the enslaved produced anything, let alone 8,000 leaves worth of coconut oil was remarkable, so much so that Monsieur Suyac reported that all of the work is proceeding actively on Diego Garcia as of 1784. Later that year, the island yielded massive catches of fish, and some enslaved workers even slaughtered enough of the invasive cattle to yield several cuts of meat. These returns revealed just how much the diverse population of enslaved women, men, and children understood the nuances of tropical cultivation. Although Diego Garcia had an equatorial climate that contrasted with the subtropical weather of the much more southerly and temperate Mauritius, the island was more similar to Mauritius than it was to France, the land that colonizers were most familiar with. Most of the enslaved laborers had seen dozens of tropical and subtropical ports in their lifetimes. Many of them had likely experienced bondage in East Africa, Madagascar, and Indi or India, and all of them had lived on Mauritius. They were not environmental novices there to release invasive species on a previously uninhabited landmass. Instead, their agenda was one of survival, and that gave them much in common with Jolie Coeur. And like this man, the enslaved people who yielded the first crops on Diego Garcia applied knowledge from across the waters in this new world. In the process, they became the first generation of inhabitants on Diego Garcia, bringing their expertise with them. Enslaved people from Mauritius ensured that the atoll was well on its way to becoming a strategic Indian Ocean node. It is this obscured yet strategic geography that initially attracted European colonizers and later the United States military. More than a history of military occupation, however, the accounts of ecological and linguistic knowledge that come out of the colonial archive matter as Diego Garcia and the rest of the Chagos Islands barrel into the future. On October 12th, 2023, Le Mauricien, the main newspaper in Mauritius, reported that representatives from the Chagos Refugees Group and also the Prime Minister of Mauritius, Pravid Jagnath, spent the better part of 2023 involved in high-level negotiations with the governments of the United Kingdom and the United States. <laughs> 
The goal was to negotiate, quote, the perfect post-colonial solution, end quote, to Shigozian displacement. Under the terms of a provisional agreement, the US military would hold on to its base at Diego Garcia and in turn allow Shigozian refugees to resettle the remaining islands of the Chagos archipelago. All of these small atolls, save for the military base of Diego Garcia, would then become the territory of Mauritius, and that country would in turn facilitate the development of a luxury ecotourism industry that would provide jobs for resettled Chagosians. Fishing, shipping, and the exploitation of rare earth minerals would round out the economy. It is tourism, however, that will likely become the dominant industry. On these tropical islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean, plush resorts with overwater bungalows, infinity pools, and manicured beaches would likely replace the coconut groves that lie strewn across remote landscapes. Luxury tourism, that is, in the eyes of the British and the American governments, Le Mauricien and the Prime Minister's Office of Mauritius, quote, the perfect post-colonial solution. Luxury tourism, in our neoliberal age, this outcome seems so predictable, logical, and almost entirely inevitable. How could this land of beaches, lagoons, and palm trees not become yet another destination for the international elite? People who would undoubtedly pay thousands of dollars to vacation on islands that few civilians in the global north could even locate on a map. As beach tourism is likely to become a source of income and the impetus for resettlement on these atolls, it is entirely possible that the cultural heritage of these islands will remain obscured. Decades of military testing and redevelopment have taken a toll on the homes, docks, shrines, and plots that once existed, while also obliterating nearly every edifice from the era of transcultural slavery. As the Chagos Islands face this predicament, architectural studies can speak to the concerns of heritage and cultural belonging on these remote atolls. Chagosians have a connection to the land, a place in world history, and a tradition of complex, of cosmopolitan knowledge that relates to this landmass. Alongside our efforts to excavate the beaches, coconut groves, and shrublands of the Chagos Islands to find examples of historic edifices, we could embrace the accounts of enslaved expertise that lie in the architectural archive. Written histories can give us a way of engaging the networks of knowledge, expertise, and belonging that have shaped Chagosian settlement. The region already has a range of local groups that architectural historians could collaborate with, learn from, and engage. Le Mauricien, the main newspaper on the island where most Chagosian refugees now live regularly publishes reports on Mauritian architecture and history. Likewise, the newly opened Intercontinental Museum of Slavery in the Mauritian capital of Port Louis intends to tell the story of Indian Ocean enslavement and settlement writ large. And since all education is public in Mauritius, we can certainly work with Mauritian educators to integrate scholarship on the history of Diego Garcia into school curricula for diverse groups of students. And in doing so, we would need to consider construction labor as opposed to architectural styles, standing buildings, and formal typologies. Labor and construction cry out from the architectural archive in a context where standing historical remnants are few and far between. In forging a reconfigured field that challenges displacement and contests the denial of Chagosian expertise and claims to the land, we could work with local communities to rethink the politics of marginalization and belonging on Diego Garcia and around the world. Thank you. So essentially, um, you know, I'm interested in Diego Garcia because, as I said in the talk, most of the research is in the field of anthropology, and so it's heavily contemporary. It focuses on the contemporary military history. Um, and really, I came across this set of documents in the French colonial archives in France that dealt with the initial settlement of the island. And so basically what that art set of materials is, is it's a series of documents 
detailing, you know, the initial settlement and the enslaved people who were brought there. And so, of course, most of the document goes into this colonial history of introducing invasive species and so forth, you know, not just cats, but all of the other tropical produce that they wanted to farm there. Um, but I think, you know, as far as what we know about initial settlement, right, this archive doesn't really have much in the way of descriptions of what buildings were like, right? We know that, yes, enslaved people in Mauritius cut the wood that was then put onto the boats to be taken to the islands. So the early architecture was similar to the kind of architecture that you would find in Mauritius and other colonial locales. But really beyond that, there aren't any, dis there are no descriptions of the buildings. There are more descriptions of the landscape, but also of labor. And so this grows out of a broader concern that I have and that when I started working on this project on architecture and slavery in Mauritius and in the Indian Ocean world, I was a bit frustrated at first because I kept on thinking, okay, what did these buildings look like? You know, what were, what were they like? And you find almost no information in the archive on what the, how the buildings appeared, but what you find is information on labor and materials. And then it took a while for me to realize, aha, uh -huh, that is the history. That is what this is noteworthy for. And I think, at least for me, thinking about what the Chagos Islands mean today, this notion that the islands were somehow insignificant, um, I think this history of labor can work against that narrative. And of course, I recognize that you know, it's not my place to say how people in the Shigo, who are Shigosian should deal with this information. I think, though, it means that architectural historians can at least approach this site and think about it, and think about the, the, the primary sources in new ways, perhaps in this more textual way that takes us into the realm of labor um, and environmental uh, damage. Yeah, and a lot of the, in terms of the documents, it's a lot of narrative descriptions, li literally accounts of, uh, so it, it is textual, it is a story. Oh, so Definitely, yes. You know, while we're gathering more, one of my questions actually is related to this. The, the museum yes. right, that you showed at, at the end, it seemed that the architecture of that building you know, and, and I suppose the way it's been articulated when they renovated uh, reflects something of, of its making in, in, in this kind of, you know, something that could be con considered stylistically mannerist or something, the, uh, the articulation of the stonework. But, you know, in that rustication, presumably reflects the, the labor that you're describing. Definitely. Do you know, is, has that been documented or does it belong on the ledger? Yeah, so actually in another part of my book, I talk about that very building. That building actually comes up a lot in my book. It's an old military hospital that was built in 1745 by a very diverse group of enslaved people. And so there actually are documents from that era that describe the extraction of coral. And so really what the building is, is you have these blocks of coral that have been extracted by divers who literally cut the coral off of the reef and then the black formed, blocks. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. black box and then formed into these blocks. And then there's also a set of materials that talk about the actual creation of the mortar um, from coral and beach sand as well. So again, even in the archive of that structure, you know, you don't get information on the stylistic intent, you, but what you really find is this history of labor and extraction. Is that the work you're doing with your colleague in geology? Yeah, so that's what we had been doing. Um, we were working on that building, and so, um, but another point that I think it relates to this broader uh, discussion is that there are only seven buildings from the era of transcultural slavery on Mauritius, and that building that I showed is the most intact one. Most of these structures are ruins, right? They're not really even buildings at all anymore. All right, more coral, more area, come on. Nikolai. Thank you very much. Wow, that's loud, sorry. <laughs> um, well, 
you, you're clearly working with the textual mat uh, material that you find in the archive, and y you're presenting us the limitations of the archive and also the governmental limitations on accessing the site. I was intrigued, considering those things, and without going into the realm of speculation, pres I, I presume that as this island became settled, some of that knowledge that was in Mauritius transfer with it. Okay. Is there anything from, I guess my first question is, are there other islands in which knowledge got moved in similar ways, in which expertise, construction expertise, or technologies that you can, if not find a parallel, find some insight on what they saw within Mauritius to uh, transport to other parts of uh, nearby archipelagos? Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, and there are two parts really to the answer. And on one level with Diego Garcia, the 18th century archive for that island is extremely limited. So that batch of materials in the French colonial archives, it's really the only batch of materials on the earliest years of settlement. So 18, or 1784 up until 1810 when the island was then switched over to, br the, to British control. Um, what I will say, though, is that you do find information in the archive on Rodrigue. Um, so here, I guess, let me, I'll point it out where Rodrigue is. Uh-oh. Oh, can we get the I just wanted to pull up the map. <laughs> yeah. So then I'll have to go all the way back to the map of the Indian Ocean. Let's see. Uh-oh, we don't. OK, so interestingly enough, Rodrigue doesn't show up. Or actually, it shows up. Rodrigue is a very tiny island located right here. It's about 385 miles east of Mauritius, northeast of Mauritius. And so interestingly enough, Rodrigue is similar to Diego Garcia in that it was populated by enslaved people from Mauritius. So mostly enslaved people from Madagascar and East Africa broadly conceived. And so there is information in the architectural archive on the settlement of Mauritius. And in fact, what we know is that the same processes of coral extraction, right, um, to create mortar were applied on Rodrigue. Um, and so there is this way in which Mauritius, even though, you know, it's an island the size of Rhode Island in the United States, it's very small, there still is, it, it does act as a point of diffusion in this broader Indian Ocean world. So islands like Rodrigue, Diego Garcia, and the Chagos Archipelago, also a, another outlying atoll known as Agalaga Island. Um, these are places where the material knowledge that enslaved people developed on Mauritius and brought with them, of course, from other places ends up being spread to those um, landscapes as well. And an interesting point is that all of these landscapes, Agalaga Island, Rodrigue, Diego Garcia, today they're actually of, of very important strategic and military importance. So for instance, Agalaga Island is a place that has, in recent years, become, or really in the past few months, um, what is what people who live on the island have noticed is that there, there is this Indian development firm that has uh, moved in and started developing this massive port infrastructure on their on their homeland. They're not being told what's happening. And so what people suspect is that basically the in Indian military is developing this island into a site like Diego Garcia. And so what everyone fears is that people who live on Agalaga are going to be evicted, much like Shigozian people um, years ago. So there is this way that these outlying islands were sources of right the export of slave labor, coconut farming, and then now in this geopolitical age of, right, in, in the Indo-Pacific being a strategic node, they're turning into militarized sites. In, in the earlier period that you studied, is there evidence of slave revolt? Yeah, so that's a good question. I, you know, I was talking before this lecture about um, the, the 17th century in Mauritius. So the thing about Mauritius is that it was uninhabited until 1638. 
it was a, a, a Dutch colony from 1638 to 1710, a French colony 1715 to 1810, a British colony 1810 to 1968, and, now, and then it became an independent nation. So there is evidence, there was a slave revolt that happened in the 17th century the under British Dutch people. rule. Yeah. yeah the and, you know, really in the French period, there were various revolts, but nothing on the order that you see in, say, Haiti yeah, or yeah. Guadeloupe. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, I'm asking because I, I think I'm probably not the only one who's looking at essentially the plan of the island. Mm -hmm which is not, you know, an island, it's an atoll, so it's yes. this incredible linear circumference that, so joli coeur, is this, like, that's the French name given? Yeah, yeah that's Pretty how heart you, or something? Yeah, it, beautiful, that's what, heart, beautiful heart. Beautiful heart, yeah. His name, yeah. So, beautiful heart, the commander, whose job it is to, is to prevent, right, slave revolt, yeah. would have had to, to command that island, and he and his colleagues, I guess, who were, in a very specific way, because you can imagine, it's so unusual, right, geographically, this strip, that it could be, you know, I assume, ta tactically kind of occupied in a manner that, mm. you know, they mu somebody must have calculated how many commanders you need yeah. and, and who, you know, who commands the commanders such that they don't themselves, you know, join their yeah. fellow slaves in revolt. So no. do you know anything about that yeah, dynamic? Yeah, an interesting, I'll go back to the map. Um, let's see, oh, maybe this is useful. So basically, this is an aerial photograph of Diego Garcia today. You could see the US military airstrip right there. Um, and so that this part of the island is really the area where all of the military activity takes place, that was in the past where coconut farming took place. So literally, the American military infrastructure has been built on top of the old area of settlement. The other aspects of the island, so from here and to here, and so really, the other parts of the island are, were, fair, were remote, right? Because of course, these thin strips of land you can't really farm much um, there. But of course, I, I'm bringing that up because I think it's important to really conceptualize how confining this space would have been, right? It's a very small island. And it's, it's a broader issue that I think comes up a lot in Indian Ocean studies. We oftentimes talk about the Indian Ocean as being this broadly cosmopolitan space. There's a lot of transoceanic cultural flow, and I think that's true, but I also think it's important to recognize how confining it would have been to be on this site, right? There's, and so really, it's about confinement, I would say. Well, is this on? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for, for your talk. I'm just kind of reflecting on these islands, you know, that people call the confetti of empire, and. Mm -hmm how they were always, you know, swapping, you know, one, one conquering the other, and also swapping some of the same the Europeans conquering mm -hmm. each other, and also swapping so many and circulating so many of the same kinds of programs, you know, and how that continues now, you know, Definitely. whether it was penal colonies or, or plantations or now ports and black sites and tax havens and, you know, that uh, resorts. Um, the, same, the same kind of, you know, movement and circulation uh, in these islands. Um, but I, I also was thinking about because of that, all of that movement and often, I'm, I'm so curious about this work on construction technologies. Because, um, you know, I think it, maybe there's, I know there's a chance that one can see how Europeans building in some of these places um, had a kind of arrogance about their construction technology. Mm -hmm. you know, they would build only in fire brick, even though they, it made them much, much hotter. You know? uh, but then some of them started using um, a kind of mixtures of techniques that were, you know, had been used in, you know, in, in, in indigenous uh, dwellings and so on. Like, mixing with the concrete, Definitely. something like straw or something, and the straw would sort of uh, absorb the humidity. And, and so in ways that you couldn't see, you know, you couldn't, mm -hmm. there was nothing about looking at the building which would tell you anything about its performance. But I'm wondering if, you know, in, in this, all this circulation, you're seeing some of those 
kinds of mixtures eventually, or if that construction technology is a reflection of colonial arrogance. Oh yeah, that's a good point. You know, I think it really leads us back to Madagascar because of course Madagascar has this long um, history of wooden construction, right? And so most enslaved people who ended up on Mauritius and then, you know, from there, Diego Garcia and Rodrigue were people who came from Madagascar. And so effectively there is this way that when you look at the historical record and, and the, the prevalence of carpentry, right? Um, effectively you can trace that knowledge back really to Eastern Madagascar and vernacular construction there. And I also think that, you know, what you find is that oftentimes it, it's not necessarily that, you know, certain groups of enslaved people were prioritized because they came from places with histories of wooden construction. It's not that, you know, Malagasy slaves were only used to build in wood, right? Effectively, I think there's this doubly relevant process that's happening where people are bringing skills that they had from their homelands with them and then that's being passed down generationally in the culture of the workshop but then also at the same time there's this reality of adaptation so that someone who worked with wood in madagascar and is working with that is also interacting with people who work with coral right and so th these new technologies and new ways of understanding this new world are combined with this transfer of traditional knowledge from other places. Um, thanks for the very beautiful talk um, and the and the thinking, um, you know, within it and beyond it. Um, I was thinking towards the end that it would be incredibly disappointing to suddenly find out about the buildings that you are researching. In other words, that the um, the more conventional, as it were, target of a kind of form, you know, uh, function, etc., is 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 the more research you do, the less relevant, and somehow this more um, subtle and almost sort of negative research, like a, a history of erasure, so not not even not even to find the materials that have been erased, but to sort of a kind of um, traces of erasure. Mm -hmm. that then, but, and then slavery is much more the thing, the object, let's say, rather than a, than a, than a kind of building. So I, I thought the work is sort of very, very, is a very sort of strong way to rethink historiography in general, because let, let us say, rather than understand this as a kind of research into a kind of fugitivity, where actual fugitivity is, is the sort of name of the game, that it's a way of rethinking what happens when somebody does have a building in front of them and, and does the research where, where what is forgotten is, for example, slavery. And so, so in, in a sense, I, I see the work as, as kind of just opening up a kind of alternative way of, of trying not to see buildings in order to see what it is that they hide. Or, mm. and, and I think, in, in a sense, I learn an enormous amount from you. The, the sort of uh, White Lotus ending, um, that there would be this sort of tourist resort yeah. and so on, um, seems to me fits into the... Um, the kind of um, extractive archaeology that Keller was just referring to, and and almost so, I almost think the kind of project to come, what did you call? It, what did they call it? The perfect future. Yeah, is somehow in such an intimate relationship with this fugitivity, mm -hmm. um, and surely this um, hotel and it, and its new new form of new form of new forms of slavery or echoes of um, will, will, will tend to kind of um, mask your research. So I, I kind of imagine you scurrying around the islands mm -hmm. before the next wave arrives, the next kind of um, military camp in the form of tourism. Mm 
looking for these layers. I'm repeating myself, but I just out of affection for the work. I think it's really oh. eloquent and, and reminds me how boring it is most writing about most historiography when there is just so much evidence, when there's a kind of, one could maybe start to discuss uh, the privilege of ev evidence. Of, you know, not, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, thank you for your comments. I mean, it's it re really the reason why I went in this direction is because of a lot of my discomfort with the way in which historic preservation operates in Mauritius today, because in Mauritius, you know, the population, there's a white minority, about 2% of the population, about 3% of the population is Chinese, and then, um, Indians, uh, Indian Indo-Mauritians comprise around like 68% of the population and then descendants of enslaved people around 27% or so. And so in Mauritius, generally historic preservation is the province of the white minority. And the reason is because since Mauritius, Mauritian history is a history of colonization, a lot of people in Mauritius who are not white, right, who are descended from Indian indentured laborers or enslaved people see the historic architecture as a remnant of a past of brutalization, right? That's something that the island wants to move away from. And so the racial politics of the island are such that in the architectural field, preservation is oftentimes couched in this language that, well, we, the white merchants, are the guardians of the true history of this island. The people in power indo merchants and descendants of slaves, they have no respect for history. And so knowing that also white Mauritians are the predominant drivers of the tourism industry, which is 30% of the economy, the fact that this plan for the perfect post-colonial solution, as they call it, is for the Chagos Islands to be developed as a tourist site, to me, it seems very likely, right, that essentially what will happen is that any excavated architectural history from the era of slavery will be something that is done and then packaged into the tourism industry to yield dividends for this already wealthy population. And so I think that by looking at this textual narrative, we, I mean, we cannot circumvent this from happening completely, obviously, but I think it could provide another way forward wherein architectural historians and preservationists don't always align with and justify their work in, in a way that fits into this neoliberal industry. And it's is, in is that who's running the museum? So actually, interestingly enough, the answer is no. And so the museum was an effort that was created out of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was established in the 1990s. And so I talk about this in the book. But um, effectively, it was a Creole-led or an initiative led by descendants of slaves to create a museum of slavery um, on the island. So, but of course, one of the justifications for the museum was that, well, it'll bring in greater revenue through tourism. So it always circles back to that in this post-colonial island, tropical island context. Can I, can I also ask you, oh, go ahead, Felicity, no, Felicity, sorry. So, um, Maybe it follows on from some of the other questions. Um, first, thank you for your beautiful talk. And I was really struck by this great formulation of Diego Garcia being an island unreachable or almost unreachable through architectural history and, and the turn you make to um, uh, also to sort of redefining construction as a, a broader category um, and, and, and ending on this question, or maybe you brought it up, that labor and materials you know, become the domain of history. And, and so there's like, on so many levels, um, uh, sort of indictment on certain absences within architectural histories, uh, you know, like sites of investigation. And but I'm sort of wondering what happens then with the the methodological framework that this produces. If you do come across something like a more conventional archive or a cache of material, like what would happen if, um, uh, or, or maybe in in the book, in other parts of the book, as you said, like what happens? Not because we would return to something more conventional in terms of the tools and methods of an architectural historian, but I sort of want to think about, like, once you push certain questions, you know, to, into a sort of fantastic new domain, like, what, what, what sort of weapon does that give you back onto more conventional objects or, or let's say, 
archives with more visual material or something. Yeah, like how then would you, um, yeah, how then would you rewrite those also? I mean, would they become reachable again or would they remain unreachable? I mean, I, I'm sort of interested in, um, in the type of um, methodological sort of refraction that, that you seem to set up as a, you know, as a potential with this work, so. Yeah, thank you, that's an interesting question. I think that in many respects, when thinking of how this method can be, if I'm understanding correctly, you're thinking of how this method can be applied in more conventional contexts, or in a context where you have actual ground plans or an archive. Yeah, I mean, so. A more visual. Yeah. I think that it could remain intact insofar as the element of labor is something that I think needs to remain. Because what worries me is that a lot of times in this architectural history of enslavement and of colonization writ large, the actual labor, and not just the fact that, okay, there were this many laborers who constructed the structure, they came from these places. More so, I think that what is missing oftentimes is this ideational world or this world where we try to think about laborers not just as individuals who, it, who exist as numbers or even as metonyms for a particular connection to a stylistic tradition from a particular place, but as people who were complicated and who had affinities to colonizers they were victims of violence, they inflicted violence, and I think that more complex world of labor is something that I think should be extracted across the board in the discipline. So, and I, that's why I brought in Jennifer Morgan's work. I mean, she is, you know, I know she's a historian, but I think that way of thinking about enslavement as existing as something that's not just in terms of production itself, but also ideas and feelings and affinities could be very useful beyond this archive. I, I was, what I was, uh, to maybe I think this adds, wondering about was, okay, there are these, also these analytical categories that you've introduced, you do, um, you know, for example, Jolie Coeur is a, an enslaved cosmopolitan, mm -hmm. which, you know, goes in the direction that you were just describing. Um, there's also, I think, maybe more running in the background here and in your work on Mauritius, the, the principle, which I think is extremely, you know, kind of suggestive uh, and difficult, of a kind of modern indigeneity. In other words, that, or a kind of produced, you know, another, you had this beautiful, right in the beginning of your talk, you know, for most of hum human history, the, <laughs> these islands are uninhabited. And then somebody comes and, in a sense, becomes indigenous. In a, in a way that, as historians, because history, of course, is a modern concept, is, you know, can be reconstructed in, you know, with all the methodological caveats and contradictions that you guys are discussing, such that we can then come to terms with a kind of indigeneity that is yet not indigenous in this sort of um, primordial sense. So, uh, you know, that seems like also a kind of portable concept in the way that Felicity is asking. I don't know, do you want to? Yeah, that? that's an interesting point because this case actually defines the Western Indian Ocean at large because Mauritius has no in indigenous population. Also, neither does Réunion Island, neither do the Seychelles, not Diego Garcia, Rodrigues. So this applies the, across the island context of the region. Um, and so it is interesting, right, this modern concept of indigeneity that actually comes up in a lot of Chagosian activism today because there is a group of Chagosian activists based in London who are planning to petition the United Nations for Chagosian people to be registered as an indigenous population. That's, of course, controversial because other communities believe of Chagosians think that that might take away from their claim to say Mauritian citizenship or Seychelles citizenship. It, and so it's a controversial topic. One thing I do in the book, I move away from being very definitive about whether this is an indigenous population or not. I think it's something that is up for debate as you say, but I think it's something that is a way that this part of the world is distinct from say the Caribbean, which it's often compared to. Yeah. 
Thank you, Dwight, for the talk. I, I was thinking, I was really struck by one of the things you said, which is what does it mean to know how to survive? And you know, it was such an interesting kind of thing, be also because often we talk about architecture as a thing, not all architecture, of course, but certain kinds of architecture that survive, and that becomes the only archive we have. But it, w what has then survived is something that you need to access in between um, you know, anthropology, sociology, like no, it's not that, but it's also not the kind of archival methodology. And so it, it then made me think about subaltern studies and, and you know, that kind of um, lineage of how to access the voices that are not in the archive. And I was thinking about, particularly about Spivak's teleopoiesis, you know, um, because I think there's some of that there when you try to capture, especially the life of this uh, woman who was pregnant, who was trying to access, you know. So what, what might have been that ideational world or that inner world of that experience. But at the same time, a lot of your references, uh, methodological ones come from, you know, the Atlantic uh, world of the history of enslaved people. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that intersection of those two methodologies somewhere between post-colonial and, uh, uh, you know, African-American studies and how you've developed, a, you know, something in between there, which also speaks to that kind of Indian Ocean status of being in between, you know, neither that nor either that. Yeah, that is a good point. I mean, it's interesting because, yes, you know, people like Jennifer Morgan come out of the Atlantic context. Of course, even the notion of creolization is highly developed in Caribbean studies. But I think it's true that in, and I think this is a controversy in Indian Ocean studies, right? There is this tendency that, okay, we want to always articulate ourselves against the Caribbean, but the Caribbean is unavoidable, at least from a methodological perspective, because of the continuities. And so I would say that effectively, methodologically, one way that the Indian Ocean is distinct, at least from a material perspective, is that you don't really, on Mauritius, have the traces of the architecture of enslavement that you find in the Atlantic context. So there are no fortresses of the slave trade. There are no plantations from the era of transcultural slavery, largely because Mauritius was not a plantation colony in the 18th century. But I think that's significant in that, you know, it's not like, say, if you went to Barbados or Jamaica, where you have the remnants of the sites of slavery there, because the island was after slavery ended, turned into this site of Indian indentured labor, that history has been obliterated. And so I think the methodological, that actually does present this methodological, or methodologically specific case. And that I think is what makes this part of the world, or that separates it or puts it in between, as you say, because I think that in you know the neighboring island of Reunion or Reunion, it's a similar story, right? This is a place with no indigenous population. There was a history of slavery, a, a history of indenture, not as extensive as on Mauritius, but e you even find this in Seychelles, where there were, it, the, these islands like Diego Garcia were not settled until very late, 1780. And then there was this, it was a history, of, as a, it was used as a quarantine site, then as a site for elite exiles in the British period. But I think that at least in the context of Mauritius, the obliteration of the architecture of transcultural slavery and the notion that, there, that descendants of slaves have nothing to really go to, to see their heritage, to find their heritage on the island, I think that requires this distinct methodology that separates us from Caribbean studies and Atlantic studies. Yeah, Hi, um, <clears throat> thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I was struck by the somewhat humorous detail of the introduction of cats to the archipelago, right, as um, sort of foot soldiers for the preparation of those lands uh, for further settlement and cultivation. And um, apologies to any cat owners in the room, but you know, cats are notorious among environmentalists and conservationists for decimating bird populations, right, in various corners of the world. And I'm just wondering if in this, um, you know, new method that you're developing in which you deprivilege traditional categories of architectural history, like style, like form and typology and so forth, if you are providing space for certain non-human actors um, 
in their space making capacities and potentials, right? And if, um, as part of this effort to recover these, these lost structures through archival sources and other textual sources, if you are also aiming to perhaps recover some of the, let's say, interspecies worlds that are lost to historical record? Yeah, that's a great question. It, you know, what comes to mind immediately is coral. You know, um, Mauritius, the main, so Diego Garcia has a massive coral reef, of course, that is has been decimated because of military development. But also on Mauritius, there's a fringing reef that surrounds the entire island, and coral bleaching is a major problem on Mauritius. But I bring up coral because, of course, in the 18th and 19th century, the reef was subjective to massive destruction because effectively that was where people were directed to go to, to mine the resources, to create building blocks, but also mortar. Um, and as far as the humorous details, you know, it, it, you find those details a lot in the Mauritian environmental history. So there's this one case from the uh, 1840s, actually, where there's this French colonizer who becomes obsessed with how he believes that the coral reef is growing at an expeditious rate. And so he says in his memoir, you know, every day I go out to the, o the, the beach and I see that the coral has grown exponentially and it's just growing every single day, every hour. It's multiplying at this crazy rate, like a plant. And so then he orders the enslaved people who are working for him to go out and cut the coral off of the reef to stop it from growing so quickly. And so looking back on it, you could see, oh my God, you know, when I read this in the archive, I thought this man is an idiot, right? Like he thinks he's so smart. He's using the techniques of scientific observation, but then coming to this conclusion that results in massive environmental destruction but I think that as far as thinking of non-human actors, I would say that coral, you know, it's a character, right, in the book because it is this mechanism that propel, is believed to be there to propel development, right? You cannot have a Mauritian architecture of settlement without the coral reef, without mortar from that reef. With, you cannot have Mauritian, and a Mauritian architecture, it's, it was believed without trees, right, These the trees of the island, which were then used to fire kilns in the mortar production process and also in construction. Another thing is that this island, Diego Garcia, and the main island of Mauritius have been subjected to massive deforestation. Um, when people first arrived on Mauritius, the vegetation was so thick that people found it difficult to even walk from the beach into the island because there were so many trees and interlacing tendrils. And now, if you look at pic photographs of Mauritius, they're really, they're, it, it, basically, Mauritius has lost about 90% of its forest cover. So you have landscapes where, basically, expanses of trees have been replaced by sugarcane fields. And, and so it's like a lot of Caribbean islands in that respect. Okay, last question to Andres. Well, this has been a fascinating talk. I, I'm, I want to commend you for, for this because I, I find it really kind of connecting so many things. And I also love the way that you, you, you delivered it because it was very kind of monotonous, serious tone. And there were moments that you could make a pause and kind of smile. And I think that has to do also with these humorous moments that like the cat. And the, but also there was the cat and it was also the moment that you explained that this guy could speak French. And that made him very different in the way he could articulate different worlds, right? And also, you smile at the time that you were showing this image of the kind of palm trees and the, the white lotus thing, right? <laughs> I think these, these three moments seem to be connected, but still you didn't explicitly connect them somehow. And if we think that, actually, there's, and there's two things that I, I think that might be behind this. One is the archive. I think that the, this ecosystem seems to be also your archive, right? Like the ecosystem itself could be read as the archive of all these things that you're really mentioning. The second thing is that I have the feeling that the, the fact that there's a person, enslaved person, that, that kind of works or positions himself in the threshold of enlightened notions of what 
pre-minus could be, or enlightenment, by speaking French. And of course, this island is a site where enlightenment in the Sylvia Winter terms is produced through colonization and the, the definition of what could be, who could be sacrificed and who could not be sacrificed is crucial. It's, it seems to be a site where what constitutes the enlightened human, it's being defined, right? And the third, I think it's the cut, actually, and I totally agree, the cut part and the, and the fact that rats could, should be sacrificed. And if we put all these things in connection, it seems that the white lotus is an ultimate evolution of all that, short of uh, a consequence of that, right? In a way, if we wouldn't find rats in a white lotus, then we would find <laughs> rats, rats in the white lotus. And definitely it's the, it's, it's the, yeah. <laughs> so I wonder what it means, because also we see that those are the images that would best circulate now, right? The cats and the beach. Uh, because it seems that you're pointing to that, right? When you yeah, said like luxury, eco-luxury, you said, so and you right. smile, yeah. seems that that's the ultimate place where coloniality is work or colonization is working now, and also the where what could be sacrificed is being defined now. Yeah, that's a, an interesting point. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't realize <laughs> when I smiled. I guess there, on one level, I, I think you know when I hear, oh, this is going to be redeveloped into a luxury tourism destination. My first thought is, oh, of course, you know. Um, and it's funny because when I teach this to my students and I show them photographs like you know this photograph here of the ecosystems that you find on Diego Garcia or in the Chagos Islands. It's not uncommon for one student to say, oh, I want to go there for vacation, right? And so effectively, I think you're right, right? That this is the way in which this place has evolved, but also the obliteration of landscapes prepares us for this moment. That effectively, it, the US military in the 1960s declared that this was an insignificant place. This is a small population of people who have no connection to the outside world in the, in the logic of the military. Their, are, their homes were destroyed, and then you know this can be positioned as reclaimed land, and that we're going to try to rehabilitate the ecosystem through tourism. And so I think that effectively that relates back to the questions of methodology for me, because in this context of obliteration and then the prospect of even more obliteration as a result of the preparation of these islands for tourism, it, I think it, offer, it brings forth the question, what can architectural historians do to speak to these processes? And so maybe it is that we don't have to lean into the landscape always in talking about built histories, that there is this other textual history that might take us away from this tendency to always think of these tropical island contexts as beautiful or or alluring in some way for settlement and you know for okay I want to go to this island to see this restored structure that relates to this the era of slavery and then of course when you're done you go to the beach right I think that's a model of of understanding historic architecture and zones of slavery that has been perfected in the Caribbean context. And so for me, in the Indian Ocean world, as it's becoming this site of greater inquiry, I think there's an opportunity to think of landscape and architecture and histories of slavery in another way that doesn't feed into the same history so much. All right, excellent. Let's thank once again Dwight Carey.